Good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Department of Environmental Studies, Ashoka University, I welcome you in our book discussion today on genetically modified democracy, transgenic crops in contemporary India. You know, uh, the book came out recently uh, globally and also in India, uh, almost uh, simultaneously. Uh, which is so good for us to access this book in India. So uh, for our department, uh, this is an important day for us uh, for several reasons. Uh, a, a very sound academic work of Aniket Aga, uh, a, a comprehensive historical, political, anthropological uh, study of a much debated a uh, controversial issue in our country and, and many parts of the world. So our heartiest congratulations, Aniket, uh, for such a solid work. Uh, Thank you. And hopefully, uh, uh, the discussion will enrich our understanding. Uh, secondly, look, uh, we know this uh, book came out at a time uh, when country witnessed dynamic, vibrant farmers' movement that also uh, shook the government to a great extent. And the issues about farmers, agriculture, agricultural policy, state, democracy, uh, they all came alive and they will be alive and ticking in the coming times. And again, we hope that uh, our discussion today will enhance our understanding about these issues and we will be able to contribute uh, either academician, either activist or campaigner uh, into the making of these issues in future. Uh, thirdly, as you know, uh, in our uh, event today, uh, we have a rich mix of speakers, uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, Suman Sahai, uh, Ellis Shashidhara, and of course, Aniket Aga, uh, who have immensely contributed in this area. And, and such occasions where uh, academics, uh, politician, science, uh, campaigner, uh, students, youth, and teachers uh, can come together in an atmosphere of uh, mutual respect and recognition uh, is always welcome and always important, especially also in our present political time in our country. Uh, and, and fourthly, uh, what Mahesh was say, saying recently, uh, that uh, this book discussion is also like a book launch. Um, I, I think I'm right that this is the first uh, uh, event organized around this book. Uh, so for us, for me, uh, this is also a time of celebration. So let's uh, uh, discuss uh, all uh, seriously, but also celebrate. Uh, so now uh, in the coming uh, more than one and a half hours, uh, I will be moderating this event, uh, and the format of the event is uh, quite simple. <clears throat> I will request first the author, Aniket Aga, to talk about his book, and thereafter, uh, 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 Jairam Ramesh, uh, Suman Sahai, and Shashi Dhara will continue with the comments and discussion. And then uh, followed by your comments, uh, question and answer uh, in, in, in that entire till, till eight o'clock, uh, we believe. So now I would like to uh, request um, Aniket, uh, Aniket Aga uh, to present his um, uh, uh, book. Uh, let me introduce uh, briefly uh, uh, about Aniket Aga. Uh, who is well known, of course, uh, not uh, required, not much introduction. Uh, Aniket Aga is an associate professor of environmental studies at Ashoka University at Ankriya University. Uh, he is interested in science and technology studies, uh, democratic politics, and agrarian studies. Uh, he works on questions of uh, environmental justice, uh, food democracy, and sustainable agriculture. Uh, with a focus on Maharashtra and Odisha. Uh, I can't resist my temptation to mention one another thing coming from the background of media and communication uh, that Professor Aniket, uh, along with Professor Chitrangada Chaudhary, have recently received uh, the prestigious uh, Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism in the Environment, Science, and Technology category. 
and his reports, his and Chitrangaja reports on illegal GM uh, cotton seeds and the uh, chemicals and its impact on biodiversity and Adivasis in Odisha are actually must read for our students. Uh, so, and, and which, which was published by uh, People's Archives of uh, Rural India. Dear students, you can note down these references. So over to you, Aniket, uh, for the coming 15 minutes. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Sharma. Uh, just a quick uh, thing, the, the, the award went to the entire climate change series of the People's Archive of Rural India of which uh, Chitrangada and I had published two stories. Just to confirm, uh, is my the, is this presentation visible? Okay. So, good evening. Thank you all very much for being here. I'm very grateful to Professor Sharma and, and the EVS department for organizing this talk, which is indeed, as uh, Professor Rangarajan pointed out, the first talk. So it's, it's um, yeah, this is a very special event for me, especially since I finished the book at Ashoka. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to Mr. Ramesh, Dr. Sahai and Professor Shashidhara for participating in today's discussion. This book is the outcome of nearly 10 years of research. A very large number of scientists, activists, academics, government officers, political leaders, journalists, entrepreneurs, and not the least, farmers and farm workers <coughs> have shared their insights and experiences with me and I am in their debt. Let me also express my profound gratitude to the three institutions that supported my research and writing. Um, Yale University, where I did much of the research that has gone into the book. The University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where I began writing the book. And of course, Ashoka University, where this book project was finished. I also uh, wish to thank Vinu Luthria and Prashant Gunjan of Orient Black Swan for publishing and marketing this book in South Asia, as also Yale University Press uh, for the global edition. This book follows the life of the ongoing unresolved public controversy surrounding the question, should India allow the commercial release of genetically modified food crops? Now, there's a lot of confusion about GM crops. So let me clarify that GM crops and conventional crops are not the same. Conventional crops come from farmers' varieties or varieties developed by plant breeders in public or corporate research stations. For instance, the onions, the chilies, the potatoes we eat, the green revolution paddy, the green revolution rice, these are all conventional crops. Simply put, GM crops are those in which one or two traits are introduced in the laboratory via the recombinant DNA technology. Because recombinant DNA technology introduces only one or two traits, it is an adjunct to conventional breeding. Uh, sometimes people talk as if recombinant DNA technology will entirely replace conventional breeding. That's not possible. And so that we, you know, just for our own, just to place GM crops in their context, 99% uh, of the GM crops globally under cultivation are in four commodity crops. 50% is in soybean, 31% in corn or maize, 13% in canola, sorry, 13% in cotton and 5% in canola. And just two traits dominate global production. Herbicide tolerance or uh, HT, which is 47%, insect resistance or BT, which is 12%, and both traits together, which is 41%. Now, herbicide tolerance is a farm management tool by which you can deal with weeds by simply spraying a, a herbicide like the controversial glyphosate or dicamba. Everything except the herbicide tolerant crop will die because of the herbicide. So you don't have to weed manually or pay a laborer to weed manually. And insect resistance crops are, are basically, uh, there's a, they produce their own pesticide or protein for a, a small class of, for a class of insects, not for all insects. So this is the global picture. 
In India, we have only BT cotton, which was approved in, in 2002. BT Brinjal, uh, which was developed by the, the respected Indian company Mahiko, has been in moratorium since 2010. Delhi University's HT mustard hybrid is also stalled since 2016. But HT BT cotton is available illegally, as is BT Brinjal, probably from Bangladesh, as per news reports. I want to stress two aspects here. There's a common misconception that GM crops improve yields, that we need GM crops to improve yields. They don't. Neither herbicide tolerance nor insect resistance raise the yield potential of any crop. Second, so that's the first aspect. The second aspect that I wish to highlight is that all of these commodity crops are linked to global agribusiness giants and global trade. <coughs> And they are at the heart of the industrial processed food and food and meat complex. The same complex by which by many accounts is responsible for forest degradation, air and water pollution, and our increased vulnerability to pandemics. So there are a range of issues that have arisen in the debate over India, allow, uh, in India over allowing GM food crops. This debate may well transform food and agriculture irreversibly in our country, which has already witnessed to deep agrarian distress, evidenced by over three lakh suicides by farmers in the last two decades. Moreover, since <coughs> India has millions of small farmers who may adopt cultivation of GM food crops, the dispute in India is of global significance. To understand this debate, I was keen not only to conduct research with farmers, and farm laborers, but also look at seed companies and state bureaucracies. Therefore, along with farmers and activists, I conducted multi-sided ethnography inside public and corporate biotechnology laboratories, offices of the union government, and offices of the union government. And I also conducted research in multiple <coughs> public and private archives to capture the historical emergence of biotechnology as a new field of science in India. All this was over two continuous years, followed by shorter spells. And I fully confess that those two years were probably the most fun and enriching that I've had. The GM debate is framed usually in terms of the global conflict between farmers and transnational agribusinesses such as Monsanto. But I argue, however, I argue in this book that this implicitly casts the Western experience with GM crops as the universal experience. <coughs> when in fact, the Indian experience is more reflective of those of many other countries around the world, especially the so-called developing countries. And the Indian experience poses a deeper challenge to our understanding of science and democracy in the context of agriculture. The deeper issue underlying the Indian debate is how do GM crops fit in a national strategy to address our food security and the needs of small and marginal farmers and agricultural laborers? In brief, how can GM crops help a public program of making agriculture remunerative, sustainable, and just? And this is not the case in India alone, at least in my reading. In many, it's the same issue in various ways, which is being, which is playing out in many countries, such as Brazil. And the reason that I say that GM crops, and the reason I say that this is the deeper <clears throat> issue underlying the debate in India, is that GM crops did not come into India with Monsanto or Mahiko. My research shows that biotechnology in our country was from the beginning a state-funded project in the service of national development. In fact, this is one of the first books to explore the history of biotechnology outside the West. In the 1960s and 70s, headstrong scientists like Pushpa Bhargava, Satish Maheshwari, Maharani Chakravarti, H.K. Das, Obed Siddiqui, Joseph Padirti, was setting up the first laboratories for molecular biology in the country. They collectively lobbied senior science administrators like Y. Nayodama, 
of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, MS Swaminathan, ICR and then Planning Commission, and MGK Menon, also CSIR, then, um, then sorry, DST and then Planning Commission. So they collectively lobbied senior science administrators and won a union department of biotechnology for themselves, reporting directly to the prime minister. So India became the first country in the world to, high, to have a high powered department of biotechnology. And this is as early as 1986. In retrospect, this was a momentous decision with mixed consequences. The nuances are in the book, but in effect, creating a new department separated the biotechnology agenda from the agricultural science priority setting happening within the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. When I read writings of India's first generation of molecular biologists, and when I interviewed some of those people, and I was fortunate because in the last three or four years, we have lost both Satish Maheshwari and Pushpa Bhargava. So two things stood out to me. First, the zeal to make a name for India and Indians in global biotechnology. And second, a lack of interest, almost a prejudice against agricultural scientists and specifically against plant breeders. And as a mirror, agricultural scientists then, and to, to an extent even today, are skeptical of what they feel is the exaggerated hype around biotechnology. What a very senior plant breeder dismissed to me as just a handful of tissue culture techniques. And this comes up again and again, I mean, in, in documents, for instance, so the documents, the policy deliberations around setting up the biotechnology. People like Pushpa Bhargava, S. Ramachandran, who became the first secretary, they are full of enthusiasm. And the representatives of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research are the most tepid. To give you a stark example of the disconnect between biotechnology and agricultural science policy making, Few know that in the early 1990s, before Monsanto could release GM cotton in the US, the company actually tried to partner with the Indian government to release BT cotton through public institutions. The biotechnology department strongly backed the proposal and negotiated favorable terms with the company. At that point, it was going to be, the deal was built just a hand, you know, few crore rupees in the early 90s. Nevertheless, the proposal failed in the face of unyielding opposition, not from activists, but from the senior, the highest echelons of the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. Incredible though this may sound today. And I'm not trying to suggest whether the biotechnology department was right or whether the ICAR was right. That's a separate debate. I'm highlighting here the strong divergence in policy making happening in these institutions, both dealing with, you know, agriculture. This disconnect has had alarming consequences over the decades. Consider where we are today. There is enormous pressure on the environment ministry's regulatory committees to assess GM, crom, GM crops from the expansive standpoint of justice, farmers' viability, remuneration, and environmental sustainability even though these regulatory committees operate from a limited technical uh, framework authorized by the Environment Protection Act. At the same time, GM crops are being developed entirely outside yeah. of any policy input and purely from a commercial standpoint. That companies are doing this is, of course, there's nothing wrong in that because companies are in the business of making profit. But nationally that this is happening by and large entirely in the corporate sector is a policy problem. 98% of, more or less 100% of cotton acreage today is under BT cotton. But the important point is it is under corporate BT cotton hybrids, which have to be purchased afresh every season. There is not a single viable public sector BT cotton for farmers. And I should underscore that India is the only country in the world where BT cotton is exclusively available as hybrids, which as, as I said, have to be purchased every season. Consequently, farmers have paid exorbitant sums as royalty 
to Monsanto principally, and a small number of companies like Nuzi Vidu, Rasi, Mahiko, are, are the dominant players. They've cornered the market for cotton seeds. I suggest in this book that this is an outcome for, of carving out biotechnology policy making away from agriculture. And of course, as many scholars like Rajeshwari Rana and A.R. Vasavi have pointed out, agricultural policy making has itself got stuck in a rut. So consequently, a lot of these issues which are in a policy deadlock, the pressure is coming on the regulatory committees of the Environment Ministry. I think no one is happy with the Environment Ministry's regulatory committees. The companies are not happy. The activists are not happy. Um, and, and they get attacked almost from every interested party in this debate. In this light, much of the activism around GM crops and Dr. Sahai's work is exemplary, is not so much about keeping all GM crops out, but about realigning biotechnology priorities with those of farmers' needs. I also argue in the book that the unique exercise in public reasoning that Mr. Ramesh as the environment minister undertook in 2009-10 on BT Brinjal, which resulted in the moratorium was about situating BT Brinjal in an overall agriculture and food policy framework, whether or not one agrees with the decision on the moratorium, uh, I mean, to, um, to uh, impose a moratorium. And even the technical expert committee advising the Supreme Court uh, has gone in the same direction. So finally, on a final note, and I'm just, I'm gonna conclude in, in a minute or two. One thing that I'm often told, even by very senior policymakers, is this, is the following. If farmers are purchasing GM seeds, they must be working for them. In other words, the sales of BT cotton is proof of its success. The final section of my book addresses this notion. But briefly, I want to ask you all a question. Will you say that the sales of dubious Ayurvedic COVID drugs means that those drugs work? I imagine not. My point is that sales figures just by themselves cannot be sufficient proof of success. Especially considering that most farmers understand BT cotton as a brand name, not a different, a genetically modified kind of cotton. Most Indian languages don't even have a term for genetically modified crops. In fact, while doing research, I would regularly look at Agro One, which is Sakar's Marathi supplement for, uh, for agriculture and farmers. And they would always invariably write BT cotton as BT cotton or GM cotton, GM in, in Marathi. There is, there is no Indian language term for GM. I mean, and there's one or two which are like high Sanskritic neologisms. And finally, most farmers are caught in a deep crisis. So these are hardly the conditions to exercise choice, meaningful choice. I'll conclude here with three questions that the book addresses and which in my view are key to take the debate forward for our agriculture. As Professor Sharma said, we have just seen a major farm mobilization, which resulted, and, and, and uh, uh, the Modi government does not usually backtrack on its decisions, but they did. But you know the, the, the entire agitation was about taking the laws back. What do we do as a positive measure is still an open question. So I just wish to raise three questions that I try and address in the book. In what way do different sciences need to come together to serve the average farmer and the average farm laborer in a just and sustainable manner? What role can private and public investment play in this? And what structures will enable oversight and feedback on new technologies from India's diverse and unequally placed publics? Addressing these questions will be key for an expansive modified democratic engagement with GM crops and more broadly, new agricultural technologies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aniket. Really well within your time. So uh, great, because we have many speakers. And then now very quickly, I will uh, now go to uh, our distinguished speaker, Jairam Ramesh. 
Uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, I know this is a very busy time for you. Parliament is on. Uh, so once again, thank you to you uh, for taking your time out on behalf of us, the department, Aniket. And also, I'm very thankful that I have Vice Chancellor Malika Sarkar is also here uh, uh, joining this event. Uh, so uh, though Jairam does not need any introduction, but this is part of the program. Uh, uh, Jairam Ramesh, is a senior member of parliament and also presently the chairman of parliament the standing committee on science and technology environment forest and climate change uh, i know that he's also playing a crucial role on some parliamentary committee on biodiversity uh, he has been a union minister uh, during 2006 uh, to 14 uh, uh, as as minister of environment and forest uh, minister of rural development uh, and, and he's also the author of uh, several uh, well-known books. Uh, so we are very happy, uh, Jairam, to have you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be present here and seeing uh, some very old friends whom I have sparred over the years, including Professor Herring, whom I see very prominently on screen and of whom I'll have something to say later on. Uh, let me begin by complimenting Aniket uh, for a first-rate book, very well written, uh, of course, deeply researched. Uh, and I found his sections on uh, the events leading up to the creation of the Department of Biotechnology, uh, particularly educative. Uh, and he has spoken to almost all the people uh, who are around still. Uh, I may have a quibble here and there, and uh, we can discuss that. But I think the, the first part of the book is a real addition uh, to contemporary history of uh, science policy in the government, uh, which resulted uh, in, the, uh, in the creation of the Department of Biotechnology in 1986. Uh, and of course, the second part of the book is uh, entirely devoted to uh, the issue of genetically modified crops and Indian agriculture. Now, my uh, association with this uh, issue, uh, first of all, I was associated uh, in, in part with the Department of Biotechnology, and this is where my quibble with uh, Aniket is. I think he underplays the importance of public health uh, as the prime mover and the driver uh, for the initial uh, activities of the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, I was very much involved, for example, when the Department of Biotechnology launched the expanded program of immunization. Uh, and um, this was, I, to my mind, more than agriculture, more than industry. It was public health that dominated the official thinking, uh, the, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and others, uh, to, to give the Department of Biotechnology a great push. Uh, and my initial years of association with the Department of Biotechnology were devoted <clears throat> to the uh, to the indigenization of the manufacture of oral polio vaccine, uh, you know, the the the, the cocktail vaccine, uh, the introduction of the inactivated uh, polio vaccine, which did not succeed. But the point I want to make is that what is often not appreciated and what Aniket um, uh, tends to underplay is that the driving force for the Department of Biotechnology was not so much agriculture, uh, was not so much food security. Those arguments were there. Uh, but I think it was the public health uh, issue that really uh, dominated uh, the official thinking. Of course, there was also uh, a lot of discussions going on with uh, the American scientific establishment, which finally led to the vaccine action plan which then led to the rotavirus and many other breakthroughs. So the one point I want to make on the first part of Aniket's book is that we should not lose sight of this public health background uh, to uh, India's foray uh, into biotechnology. It was, it was health driven, uh, less industry driven, uh, less agriculture driven. Now, let me come to the second part on, on the agriculture side. Uh, it's, it so happened that uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Swaminathan, uh, who was uh, one of the key figures in the creation of the Department of Biotechnology, um, agriculture did figure in the scheme of things. It did figure. It, it's not as if it did not figure. Uh, 
but it was always understood that the, that the locus of all agricultural research uh, in this interface with biotechnology would be under the ICAR system, uh, and it would not be duplicated uh, through a network of laboratories under the DBT system, which very often happens. So today you will find, for example, uh, very many laboratories uh, in the ICAR network very active in the area of biotechnology. And that was by choice. Uh, I think the, uh, the planners, particularly Swaminathan and MGK Menon, and I remember attending some meetings in the planning. I was in the planning commission at that time. And I remember attending some meetings. Uh, and there was a very conscious choice said, taken that, you know, we cannot uh, do bypass surgery on the ICAR. Of course, ICAR was a difficult organization to manage. Uh, it has had a long and troubled history. Uh, and uh, so people were not very sanguine about whether ICAR will make this quantum jump, uh, which was required. And M. V. Rao, uh, you know, who figures uh, in Aniket's book, was a was a you know was a conservative. Uh, he was a wheat breeder. He was a conservative figure, uh, and not a great gung ho champion of biotechnology, uh, as many other later people ended up becoming. So uh, my association uh, with the bio, with the GM part of Aniket's book is really restricted to the two years of 2009 and 2010, and then spending the next 12 years dealing with the consequences uh, of, of the decisions that I took. I can do no better than actually to quote Professor Herring, uh, who in a seminar organized at Tinmurti, uh, when Mahesh was the director, I don't know whether Professor Herring will recognize this, uh, he, he very succinctly summed up uh, you know, my approach to uh, the GM issue. He said, the Americans are permissive, the Europeans are prohibitive, uh, but uh, Mr. Ramesh is precautionary. So I think that's a, that was a fair summary of where I was coming from when I was an environment minister and when I was um, faced with this decision on whether to uh, com allow commercialization uh, of uh, BT Brinchot or not. I hasten to add that um, this was not, uh, it was not, my intention was not to raise theological questions uh, on, on biotech in agriculture, but it was restricted to the narrow issue of whether BT Brinjal deserves uh, commercialization. Uh, and I found uh, very weighty arguments against it. First of all, BT Brinjal had nothing to do with food security. So I found it odd that I'm being asked to uh, you know, decide on an issue, uh, which has nothing to do really with food security. Um, there are arguments on pesticides use and so on, but that's got nothing to do with food security. Secondly, um, you know, I was persuaded that uh, there existed no scientific consensus uh, on the protocol of tests that re required to be done, particularly the area of safety and toxicity. And the scientific community itself was was, was divided. Uh, thirdly, I found no consensus, consensus amongst the state governments, including, uh, you know, agriculture is a state subject uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in India, although we behave as, it's, as if it's a concurrent subject, it was actually technically a state subject, but none of the, none of the states, uh, whether it was a CPM state or whether it was a uh, you know, a regional party state, whether it was a BJP state, whether it was a Congress state, no state government was in sympathy uh, with the introduction of commercialization of BT Brinjal. Uh, and, and the final argument uh, that weighed in my mind, of course, was uh, the, the argument that uh, Professor Swamina, Dr. Swaminathan made to me, uh, which I have uh, quoted extensively in my speaking order, which is that in, in crops where India is the center for genetic diversity, uh, we ought to be uh, extra cautious. We ought to be really careful uh, before we you know, unleash uh, the biotech uh, weapon. So these were, these were the arguments uh, that weighed uh, to decide on the moratorium. And the moratorium was never intended to be a ban. The moratorium was intended to buy us time to do three things. One, to create a professional appraisal body, uh, a biotechnology regulatory authority, so to speak. Two, uh, to get the states on board uh, uh, and, and create a more durable political consensus. Uh, and three, 
to get a, a commonly agreed protocol uh, for for the, the tests which are required uh, to make uh, these um, uh, you know the gm crops more acceptable now none of these three conditions have actually been fulfilled in the last 12 years uh, and successive environment ministers have come we've had successive changes change in government uh, and uh, the moratorium has stuck um, and uh, I want to make a few observations now on this. Uh, you know, one of the initiatives that I took, uh, which, um, you know, I was very keen on was to get all the scientific academies on board. Uh, you know, there is no tradition in India of getting Indian scientific academies uh, to discuss issues of science policy uh, and give recommendations on government, which is very normal uh, in the US or the UK or in Europe. Uh, and to my horror, uh, when, I, when, I dis when I had a meeting with all the six major scientific academies, uh, I did not get, uh, you know, uh, any, any uh, help, any value addition. In fact, that itself uh, created a controversy of sorts, which those of you who have followed the debate, uh, you know, will 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 recall. Secondly, uh, the, 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 one of the big issues, perhaps the most important issue, uh, in two thousand and ten, uh, was the seed issue. Uh, was the monopoly that this would uh, this would lead to a monopoly uh, and Monsanto was very much uh, on, on people's minds. It certainly was on my mind. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, of course, the situation has changed now, but I do want you to remember that there was this context uh, to the decision that got uh, taken in 2010. Uh, apart from the scientific academies and the seed issue, what has struck me in the last 12 years uh, is the fact that um, uh, a government that has reversed almost all decisions taken by its predecessor government uh, has not uh, found it um, expedient uh, to reverse the moratorium decision. Uh, and here I do want to uh, highlight a very sort of, a, you know, uh, I, I found it rather ironical that the greatest support for the moratorium to me, uh, both in 2010 and in 2022, comes from the RSS, you know, uh, the, the it's the the ideological right uh, has applauded my decision much more than many of my own colleagues did uh, in, in, in the cabinet and in the ministry. Uh, and I found that I think that's one of the reasons why the prime minister has not uh, found it easy uh, to decide, for example, on Deepak Pentel's uh, rape seed mustard issue, where much of the opposition uh, came from outside the government and not uh, within the government. So um, let me end with a final thought that uh, uh, my activity, my speaking order, my involvement was uh, restricted to transgenic crops. But maybe now we are no longer in the era of transgenic crops. Maybe transgenics have become irrelevant. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Shashidara will educate us much more on this. But as a layman, seeing the developments that are taking place on genetic markers or, or on gene editing, uh, it seems to me that, you know, this whole issue of transgenic crops, we are fighting yesterday's battle. Uh, and there are other battles to be fought, uh, you know, in, in the years ahead. So uh, I think uh, this issue is, is going to remain. Uh, I think the food security argument is going to be a very, very, very important argument. And there's also going to be the other argument uh, is um, uh, to which we can discuss. I mean, if BT cotton was all that much of a, uh, you know, scientific um, um, uh, washout as Aniket and many others uh, have claimed, and as some of the figures show, how is it that over 98% of Indian farmers continue to grow uh, BT cotton? And how is it that the area under cotton cultivation has in fact not come down and not stabilized, but actually increased? And as a consequence, India has emerged as the world's largest cotton producer. So there is a, there is a paradox on this. Uh, you know, the, the one view of the BT cotton says that we've reached a yield fatigue, we've reached a yield plateau, but uh, from the farmer's point of view, and this is an argument uh, to which I really have no answer. Uh, when people in parliament argue that, how is it uh, that you're taking this view on BT uh, cotton and, um, uh, and you know, people have written about this, but th the fact is that in reality, uh, farmers are continuing to embrace it uh, with great gusto and enthusiasm. Uh, 
So uh, let me congratulate Aniket. Uh, we can take many of these issues up during questions and answers. Let me congratulate Aniket. And uh, it was a very nostalgic moment for me to read the book. Uh, and um, it was, I personally, for me, it was an education in many parts of the book. Uh, and um, I think uh, we are going to uh, see uh, I mean, this debate has not died out. I mean, particularly from a food security point of view, this debate has not died out. And so this will continue to remain uh, on, on, on the agenda. And therefore, the whole issue of what should be our biotechnology strategy in agriculture assumes special significance. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh. I hope um, this is one of our largest meeting, uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, uh, around 200 people. So you must be feeling good about it. Uh, you're not <laughs> losing in terms of audience. Uh, so uh, now I will invite uh, uh, Dr. Suman Sahai uh, as the next speaker. Uh, Suman Sahai, again, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, he's, a, he's a founder chairperson of Gene Campaign, a leading research and advocacy organization working on issues of uh, related to food, nutrition, and livelihoods. Uh, she's recipient of many awards, including Padma Shri, uh, the Bodlog Award, the Out Outstanding <coughs> Women Achiever Award, the Birbal Sahani Gold Medal, and, and many more. Uh, she chaired India's Planning Commission Task Force on Agrobiodiversity and Genetically Engineered Organism for the 11th plan and was also a member of the steering committee of the National Biodiversity Board, the expert committee on biotechnology policy, and the bioethics committee of the ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research. Uh, people like us, uh, like Aniket, have immensely gained from our association with Dr. Usuman Sahai and Gene Campaign. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Suman Sahai, for your time. Uh, I know you're always busy. Uh, so over to you, Dr. Suman Sahai. Yes, let me let me begin by congratulating Aniket for a very good book. Uh, I, I read it with great excitement and with deep appreciation because it's possibly the first book uh, that I have read, and I have read many in this genre and this subject, which has systematically explained uh, the trajectory of how GM crops and biotechnology came to be positioned in India. And what were the developments? And if you trace this trajectory, you see where the problem started and why the problems persist. Exactly those problems that, uh, that Aniket highlights in how this was birthed is why we have not been able to resolve the issues despite several efforts both at the level of legal action, of activism, uh, the, the issues have remained. What is particularly enlightening, and I think Aniket himself has flagged that in his introductory talk, is the genesis of biotechnology as a subject, as a department, and its political power and positioning in India's scientific policy. And it may have been health that drove initial uh, biotechnology thinking and, and crystallization, but it was always a food security issue, always from the beginning. And the debate in, not only in India, but also globally has always been GM technology will solve hunger. That is, that was then and that is today, because that was the most emotive thing. You talked about uh, hunger all the time, and um, this was the technology that was going to fix this problem. And therefore, the appeal of that, of positioning this as the solution to hunger, really drove a lot of the debate on GM technology and continues to drive it. We have got now follow-ups with uh, CRISPR and gene editing, et cetera, but it still goes in the same direction. The debate continues to be this technology that will solve the world's biggest problem, hunger and malnutrition. So it is, it is very educative to, uh, and I think it's a, this book should be read by a larger public, not just the people who are concerned with science policy and 
uh, and science itself, you see how it was a coterie that controlled biotechnology, how it was a complete coterie that controlled regulation, that it was essentially an exercise that remained in bureaucratic hands. And I think one of the most interesting examples which, which Aniket highlights in the book is the import of COCA 312, which is the mother, if you will, of BT cotton, which in that sense is the mother of the advent of biotechnology in India through COCA 312 and the BT gene, and then therefore the BT cotton, which remains the only approved crop. The way that a single bureaucrat, without informing his minister, without consulting his colleagues, actually gave permission for the import of 312. And this has to be seen in the context of what happened with regulation much, much later and continues to happen. The reason why India's regulatory systems relating to GM crops are contested all the time started then. It started with this uh, arrogant and ad hoc action and the control and impact of the bureaucracy, a certain quarter of bureaucracy, um, on this technology and its, and its forward journey uh, led to many of the conditions that began to influence the way biotechnology was done, the way it was perceived, and the reactions to it. Those who were proponents believed that going through this bureaucratic coterie could uh, give decisions in their favor. And I think a lot of those who were concerned and those who critiqued and those who were wanting to ask questions realized that there was not an open enough, not an inclusive enough uh, system where participatory um, questioning of, of policy and policy decisions could happen. So that is one very interesting part of the book. And I think a very educative part of the book. Also, Aniket brings out that the debate in India on GM technology was much more nuanced, much more layered and, and complex and inclusive of several uh, factors uh, that did not really happen everywhere else. I mean, there were massive protests, at, if you remember at that time, um, on GM technology, it sort of petered out a little bit, not only because of the pandemic, but there was a, a lot of anti-corporate. Here was this great big giant Monsanto, which was the bad guy, and you were talking about freedom of food. All these are relevant. Uh, the freedom of choice and who is going to dictate my food and what's going to happen to my plate. This dominated, I think, uh, the debate to a very large extent. In India, however, you see that the debate took on board many things. Most of all, most importantly, and that has been also part of Gene Campaign's focus, what is this technology going to do for farmers? And has anybody really bothered to ask farmers? There's this supremely arrogant view that you don't need to ask people, an expert view is enough. But in India, uh, the expert view was challenged. And this is not an isolated thing that happened in India. If you will recall at that time, there was across Europe and the United States and many other countries, a challenge uh, to expert views. There was a distrust of experts. And this was a very widespread phenomenon, a distrust of expert views for a variety of reasons. I think the younger generation felt that uh, you didn't have to be a subject expert to be able to influence policy and that there were other ways of influencing policy in a more pro-people way. So this was a climate of distrust or distrust of expert views. And this is reflected very much in the Indian debate. You see the, the kind of things that, that were said when people positioned an argument as that coming from the experts from so-and-so and such and such. And they were rejected just because and that is for me a very interesting phenomenon because I think it speaks of how uh, we must be cautious about how to frame public policy, especially science policy. There's no point in, in bleating about how this one knows that much and scientists know everything. Unless the technologies are going to be acceptable, it's going to be very, very difficult to move forward. And I think that would be a pity. I mean, technologies can do a lot of good. They can also do a lot of bad, if you will, but they can do a lot of good. And I think we must be, we must have the wisdom to create systems where 
the good of technology is able to come out and, and be. And the only way to do that is to be inclusive, to talk to people for who, who should be the consumers of this technology. And this is very apparent in the case of GM crops and hunger, GM crops and food security, GM crops and, <clears throat> and nutrition, et cetera. This didn't happen. Um, Jean Campen, along with the University of Hyderabad and IIT Delhi, conducted a study, a three-year-old, a three-year study on, across five locations on uh, knowledge, attitudes, and perception. I mean, this is a, a social science kind of study. How do people look at this technology, and what do they, what do they uh, think it's doing for them? So, of all of the things, everything was paraphrased. Wasn't it wasn't BT Cotton? It wasn't HT. It was paraphrased into uh, into questions about a technology that would do this and that and not do that and this. For example, HT Cotton or HT as a trait was positioned as suppose you were able to lower your labor costs and uh, solve your wheat problem because that is a problem in in rural India. Labor costs are going up. Weeding is uh, an issue. Uh, so there is. Whereas this was something that the HD technology was was uh, offering, but if you bring in the other aspects that you will not have your green vegetable, you will not have your jari puti, your medicinal plants, is that acceptable? And you will see from the results of the study that there's a great deal of reservation on that. I don't think that it is um, such a great advantage to take care of your weeds, but lose everything else. You lose your, your, your local healing herbs, you lose your fodder, you lose your uh, supplementary food as in green vegetables or, or leafy greens, et cetera. So if you position the technology in, in language and, and idiom that we all are familiar with, including farmers, you will get a much more honest understanding of how people, farmers, consumers think about the technology. And uh, those days are gone that you, you impose technology from the top. So we have to take that on board. And I think it's a good way to understand how science policy and decisions will have to be taken in future if we don't want to abort every avenue of making progress through science and technology. It has also questioned, the Indian debate has also questioned, uh, and I think in some ways successfully and in some ways not so much as to, uh, who all should be included in the decision-making process? Whereas this is codified in the Cartagena Protocol about public participation in decision-making. It hasn't really been implemented anywhere. In, in no country in the world that I can think of has public participation in decision-making been really successfully implemented, except perhaps in some uh, North European countries, uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, uh, I can remember Denmark did a, did a huge exercise um, in Aarhus and they attempted to bring, but huge numbers of questions came out of that. And that is, who is the public? How, how binding will be the public's view? And it only brought forth the difficulty of bringing in public participation without careful thought. You have to create a structure. It's not something that can't be done and it's not rocket science, but somebody has to take uh, that on as a subject and create a framework of how will you do public participation and what will you do with the public's inputs into decision making? Will they become binding? Are they advisory? To what extent will they uh, influence even the discussion and further debate? So those questions need to be answered. Um, Aniket has again dealt extensively with the challenges to uh, decision making in, in GM crops, uh, the public interest litigation that was filed. And the first public lit litigation, uh, the petition was filed by Gene Campaign. And we felt the need to do that because the Department of Biotechnology was not willing to listen and not engage in debating. Now, the only reason I make that point is again, how was decision making being done how was the public being uh, included or not included? How was critique being addressed? Was there an effort to continue with a dialogue or was there a stonewalling? These are all issues that came up at the time and uh, led us to file this petition. Asking for what? Asking for a regulatory framework 
that was competent, transparent, and inclusive. It was not asking for a ban. It was not even asking for a, a moratorium. Only it was asking that till you get a regulatory system in place, that is all of these things that the petition was asking for, you hold back the release of any further GM crops. And uh, this ran into uh, the sand for a number of reasons, which, which Aniket has also described in his book. And what, 17, 18 years down the line, it's still sitting there. There's no decision. The courts have gone back and forth and here and there, and we still have not come to some decision despite the, the technical expert committee's report, et cetera. The politics around uh, GM technology became fraught and no resolution has emerged as yet. And I think that is cause for concern. We really need to move forward on how we will deal with technology adoption in future. And this book points out many of the reasons why it's not moving forward from the past experience and gives you lessons uh, or, or flags indicators of why it must be done. I mean, I, as a scientist would say, it would be foolishness in the extreme to abort science and technology options, solutions, just because there are grave concerns right now. And grave concerns there are. Huge risk issues and safety issues exist. They need to be resolved. And I think Aniket's book points out even, even his uh, title, Genetically Modified Democracy, that it has to be a democratic process. It has not been a democratic process so far, starting with the coterie of bureaucrats to the way that this whole thing has developed controlled by the Department of Bi Biotechnology. There's a lesson by the ICR uh, and biotechnology were not on the same page. And I think the, the simplistic view on that and uh, perhaps a very accurate view on that is that ICR understands right from the days of, the, of uh, research, even predating the Green Revolution, is that agricultural research or science and technology must answer India's problems. And India's primary problems start with agriculture. If you don't have strong agriculture and farmers that can successfully do agriculture, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And down the line, we've seen that. If you can't handle your agriculture, you're going to have a lot of problem handling anything else because you'll have large numbers of people who are engaged in this activity who are not able to move forward and become prosperous. So I think that's a very important lesson uh, that we must take away from this book. The reason I think that this book must be widely read is because at the, at the center of genetically modified democracy is the question of how our food will be in the next years. India has so far to some extent resisted the industrialization of the food chain, but it is happening now. It, it has been happening for the last few years and it's gaining pace. Your we have seen in, in, the, um, in, in the last few years that the way that India was producing its food and, and eating its food has changed dramatically. I think processing is a great idea, but industrialization perhaps not so much. So who's controlling the food? Who's, where is the vertical integration of food taking place? And, the, and uh, because it concerns all of us, I think, you have to look at GM technology seriously, even though you're not interested in science and technology per se, because it's going to dramatically alter the way food is produced, the, food, the way that food is presented and made available to the consumer, and the way that food will be then willy-nilly be eaten, because that's what you will have available. I mean, the question raised about BT cotton, Mr. Ramesh raised that about why is it that it's still so successful? One part of the answer surely is because the other varieties have disappeared and you, your dependence on the seed dealer is so huge. Uh, Jaydi Bhartikar's book will show you how this has grown over the years. The seed dealer is your banker, is, is, uh, is so many things, uh, but primarily your banker. And he tells you what he will give you on credit. 
And we have seen in BT cotton, in the case of BT cotton, that the promotion of BT cotton by corporations and by companies that wanted to promote the BT cotton, they did it through the incentives to the seed dealer. So that's certainly one part of the answer because if I go there, I need a loan, I need seed for the next crop, what seed will I get on loan? If the seed dealer who I'm dependent on says, well, these are the three BT cottons that I have, you're welcome to take one of these, I have nothing else. Then your acreage on the BT cotton goes up uh, naturally. Uh, there is another aspect to this, and that is the Indian farmer is very, very keen on trying out new things. And the, the Indian farmer, um, when told that here is something new and wonderful, it will do wonderful things for you, is very likely to try it out. And th that was also an important part of why. So in conclusion, I will say that uh, this outstanding book has explained a very important part of the debate on Indian, uh, on GM technology in a more sophisticated way because the Indian debate has been more sophisticated and Anikit has succeeded in bringing out its nuances. And I will uh, just read out a little bit as my last thing from his book on what happened with the task force on agrobiodiversity and uh, genetically modified organisms. The, firstly, the task force was um, extremely inclusive. It included all kinds of scientists and ecologists and policy experts and social scientists. The attempt was made to bring on board as many views as possible. And if you go through the report, you will see that the issues and concerns that were raised at that time, and this was in 2007, 2008, none of those have been resolved. So we seem to have a recalcitrant governance structure. And we need to change that. Maybe people who read this book and people who, who, who think about these issues uh, might have better ideas than I do about how to change the situation. But I see grave, I mean, I have grave concerns about how we will, how technology adoption, acceptance, rejection will pan out unless we deal with these core issues about what went wrong and how it went wrong. Because I think there are several indicators of how to do it right. I mean, political will is only one of them. So congratulations again, Aniket. It's a, it's a really good book. And I think it's a, it's a great addition to research material in this field. So yes, I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sahai. Now, very quickly, I go to L.S. Uh, Shashidhara, who is a professor of biology at Ashoka University. Uh, he has served as vice president of Indian National Science Academy and is currently the president of the International Union of Biological Sciences. Uh, he has served serving as a member of various national and international committees on science and technology policy. Uh, thank you, Shashidhara. I know uh, you were also quite busy, but uh, really thanks that you are giving some time. To us. Thanks, thanks, Mukul. First, uh, Aniket, uh, congratulations for this wonderful book. And, uh, you know, uh, it's also sort of, you know, considering that, uh, you know, um, uh, actually, I should be really frank and up. You know, uh, although apologetic, that I read the book only recently after you put me as a, as a you know panelist here, I would have read anyway, but I'm taking more uh, leisurely some time. This area is definitely for, you know of interest, personal interest to me, and not only as a as a scientist, and at the same time, in my capacity in, in very different platforms, you know, this topic has come again and again. Uh, I'm not going to express my personal opinion and in this particular one. I think that what is important is how to how to how to construct a debate around such you know controversial subject right topics. Technology is always controversial. People have to address, you know accept first because technology has multiple issues around it. You know when we talk about science, initially the technology you know, whatever the, some of the larger kind of a technology were developed mostly to facilitate better scientific understanding of the nature, microscope, telescope, and so forth. Only in the last 500 years, there have been a massive, you know, expansion of technology 
for technology, technology for, for making money, not necessarily to solve the problems of the society. I, I think it, we have to understand that when scientists, there are, you know, there are scientists also as representatives of this society, and we all work you know, in, a, in a very different, we may use scientific methods, we have certain you know, ethics, integrity, and, you know, and so forth we claim, but we also have to understand that once the state sponsoring science, which happened about 200 years ago, you know, uh, typically at the expansion of industrialization, the country started, particularly European small countries, you know, by the time they had a, you know, initial, they competing for colonizing the rest of the world, you know, post Renaissance, you know, Western European Renaissance, and then with the tech, you know, 200, 1800 and above post Newton's work and technology development became much faster, accelerated because you understood the laws of motion. You can use Newtonian mechanics to develop better engines and better technology and so forth. And people started now, the countries started sponsoring uh, technology development because that gave them an edge in over other countries uh, in international platforms. And the, the, the competition also made them to start using technology for fruit production. They also realized that the food can be used as a tool, right? And, and that tool is basically, you know, you know, the countries which do not have sufficient food, you donate or export, but in the way you get some kind of a, you know, additional benefit in it. I'm not a social scientist to discuss, you know, the socialism versus capitalism versus the MNCs and all those things. But, you know, in reality, technology is always used by the governments, by the MNCs for certain benefits and not necessarily purely on philanthropic reasons. Even the public health has not been used, or technology for public health has not been used purely on a philanthropic, uh, you know, pure purity of mind. So obviously, you know, the debate is about having caused problems of, you know, not having enough food, not having, not having been able to provide sufficient nutrition to our children, right? How do we solve the problem of the society? To what extent we can depend on the technology? Now, once the problems exist, then people will also, will sort of look for solutions. It's not only the government or large companies which have deep solution to solve the problems. In the process, they also want, but the people also want some solutions for their problems, right? That's where Indian farmers come into picture. Then, you know, initially the, the Green Revolution solved the problem of that time, but we created more problems, but particularly large dams submerged so many forests, you know, soil degradation happened because of indiscriminate irrigation and use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and so forth, which have become you know, almost an epidemic, you know, uh, scale of the problem. So you always look for new solutions. And again, you go back to technology and see whether technology solves the current problem and it may create new problem, which happened in some cases, for example, you know, uh, in invasive species, large number of invasive species which are affecting our pristine forest is largely many of them, both plants and animals, including fish and such forth, are introduced deliberately, thinking that they will solve some problem, as you know, whatever they exist at that time, but you know, created the problems. And so, however, 21st century with 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 incorporate with sort of adoption of uh, data science in all aspects of our of our studies, academic studies, right? Whether it is in social science, economics, or anthropology, and of course natural sciences, we thought we'll be better off in in understanding the impact of any new technology we introduce, right? Data driven, knowledge based. Uh, policy we can frame once we know what is this technology, how it may solve the problem, what new problem it may create, and so forth. 
and making people aware of this capability of modern science and data science and our ability to you know understand even the you know the social impact of technology right uh, with with uh, you know uh, better use of data science uh, and hopefully we thought we can come out with more sustainable solutions to problems so the sustainable development goals of un you know un declared this year in the summit uh, recently that um, 22 23 is going to be called as international year of uh, basic science for sustainable development right and there's also a, a, you know uh, uh, another un sponsored program that is basic science for alleviation of poverty and extreme poverty is increased you know inequality has increased so what have we solved in, in the end of 20th century is always a big question with the help of modern science and technology is the problem of the technology is the problem of the way technology is used right and so because the technology has solved problems of some people and not all and has created a problem for everybody and that's what uh, there's a mistrust of the technology itself and in in the co indian context we also have a mistrust of our policy makers our government uh, uh, the governments to some extent and and typically when it comes to agriculture considering how traditional practices are still in place and how fragmented the whole agriculture sector itself introduction of some kind of a technology across the country is, is supposed to be almost you know something which, which you should not even think of it like you know formulas they were you know nothing to do with technology even the formulas commonly it had to be retracted because it's not something which works in a country like india right you cannot have a one centralized solution to country of our size and diversity particularly and in the context of farmers. Now, I'll, tell you, I'll give one example in the context of BT cotton, because everybody talks about BT cotton when it comes to GM. There are two aspects to the BT cotton. One, of course, the mistress of them, men's seeds, you know, depend on their seeds, and then how do we know the seed qualities of the rights? Maybe they were getting, you know, the cotton seeds labeled as GM cotton seeds, but they're actually not GM, simply under one. Now, there's also another added problem with this. Indian farmers are all small landholding, you know, farmers. Unlike in US, you have 2,000 acres, 2,000 acres of land. You can grow one particular crop, one particular variety, whether it's GM or non-GM, doesn't matter, and use certain method of agriculture. And without or with minimal impact on the land and the air, hopefully you can actually, and also on people, you can grow well. But India, you cannot afford to do that. You know, I have one acre, two acre, three acres. Let's say in, in Gujarat, when they are growing GM cotton in the beginning, if 50 people, 50 farmers in a village are growing, maybe there could be one or two acres of, you know, G, cotton, which is not GM, either because spurious seeds or because the farmers didn't have money to buy GM seeds, they grew regular one. And if you don't, if it is spurious, and if you think that it is GM and don't, spray pesticides all the pests would come to that more because the neighboring land is all gm you know pest resistant but the pest the the grows to such a large population this is where the population ecology comes into picture right the population of the pest will grow enormously because you have a very nice field which has no pesticide is sprayed and it's not pesticide resistant are sorry, pest resistant and once the population size increases even the so-called pest resistant varieties will not be any more pest resistant so the gm technology it's not completely population size independent it may be pest resistant like for example if the 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 caterpillar number is let's say x per acre right it may be resistant what if it is 2x per acre right the same GM crop would not be resistant. So these, you know, was 
the this issues were never discussed in indian context when these was introduced not people who were talking about gm crop or any kind were not thinking about the agriculture practice in this country right uh, i think these are the issues we need to discuss and there is a lot of mistrust definitely about these mncs it could be amazon here or it could be uh, you know uh, anything i mean so there are also people who are you know anti technology thinking that technology has created more problems but the problem is you know whether it is irrigation sorry hydroelectric power whether it is um, introduction of invasive species now for car, you know for carbon neutral land you know uh, environment we are trying to introduce trees which are fast growing high dense in their photosynthetic ability so that they can actually you know sequester carbon much faster which is required because you know the if you are to you know reverse the greenhouse effect but the problem is if you once you introduce that kind of a tree it will going to disturb the local ecosystem local biodiversity the birds and you know insects will not be properly uh, supported by these kind of trees if they don't get supported then there can be other problems including for example mosquito problem and dengue chikungunya may start spreading malaria may start spreading you know we we also need to understand the the our natural ecosystem much better uh, earlier we didn't do it right and we cannot blame some of them them you know i keep giving you know this example uh, apparently you know one of the you know founders of modern india visheshwaraya he went to see joke falls and everybody every poet or every anri citizen used to be awed by the the fall of water but apparently you know visheshwaraya remark was water colossal waste and he proposed that we should have an hydroelectric power station here and that's submerged huge land, you know forest do we blame visheshwaraya for his you know was he west, had was doing this out of vested interest was ignorant didn't have any understanding of science and technology or the understanding of science and technology at that time was so minimal people didn't even realize that there can be have such you know impact on, on on land and forest of course they're all debatable and uh, but now we have better tools to forecast better better tools to simulate before we introduce anything and like the way vaccines were developed and simulated and and also some clinical trials were done i think this is the best approach that use the science and technology to understand the technology first understand the impact of technology and then you start discussing with the social scientist and economist the impact of introduction of technology having understood you know all aspects of it and see whether it is good you know if, what would be the impact of of introduction of such technology then the third level is everybody should be consulted and that's very important i think there is no doubt that democratic country cannot ignore the democratic you know opinion of the people and and that that has to be part of any policy frame people nowadays they say you you know draft policy put it on the web and anybody can comment you know recently many such you know, new education policy draft was there for one year and anybody can comment and somebody could comment those who commented they say now our comment were never considered these issues will always come but you know in in a, i think i don't know ours is still growing and democracy still need to you know, be more matured small countries may be easier large 1.5 billion countries with diverse language you know and learning skills and even literacy uh, it may be more difficult i think technology that i know uh, jairam ramesh already you know uh, uh, given explanation i think there's something as a scientist one thing we worried that the this moratorium on on technology you know trials it doesn't have to be field trial it could be even contained you know field trial it could be even the lab trial level you know work because even the lab level we had to go to rcgm to get the permission but the gm technology not necessarily 
to make develop a GM crop. We want to understand the nature itself, right? In fact, the first biotechnological intervention was recombinant DNA technology to understand the very nature of chemical basis of life. Later, people thought that perhaps we can make insulin using bacteria, and then they, the Chiron started selling insulin, recombinant insulin. Now we have many, many recombinant proteins as part of the public health uh, you know, solutions. So I think technology is still important to understand the, you know, what is what causes you know, some disturbance to the natural system. And so total moratorium is, 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 is also wrong. And we need to remove that. I hope, you know, there'll be some, uh, you know, wisdom and, and then we'll prevail and hopefully they will remove that. I'll stop here. I think I've already taken much longer time. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Shashidha. Very quickly now we have less time. So um, uh, I would like to request to uh, all the speakers and Aniket to go through the chat box. Uh, we have comments and queries from uh, Chivan Kumar, Ron Herring, Dr. Ashish, Viswajit Mishra, Amita Babaskar, Mahesh Rangrajan, Paritos Kumar, Lata Jishnu. And uh, you, can, you can just uh, think about your responses. Uh, very quickly, for the coming 10 minutes, uh, I will request uh, the participants to, if anybody would like to raise anything, say anything, other than these people who have already given their comments. And then after uh, uh, 10 minutes, I will request Jairam Ramesh, Suman Sahai, and Shashi Dharar to speak very briefly in response to the comments and queries. And then at the end, uh, Aniket will uh, give his final uh, uh, word. So uh, anybody uh, for the coming 10 minutes would like to, yeah, Ron Hearing, yeah, please. Jaron Ramesh's comment that GMOs are yesterday's news and yesterday's battle is absolutely true. And I would like to know what is the situation with CRISPR and gene editing uh, in India these days, either regulatory framework or scientific progress? Because in the United States, we found uh, literally a cure for sickle cell anemia by editing um, patients that are subject to that horrific disease who are almost entirely colored people. So I'm, I'm wondering about the possibility of, of CRISPR gene editing in India. And the second thing uh, was the, the story about, um, yes, globally, uh, Jerome and Resch also raised the issue of right-wing opposition to technology. This is to me the most terrifying thing about the future, a, a, a post science world in which everything becomes a political battle, not a matter of science. So for example, if you, if you just do a relationship between refusal to take vaccines in the United States, it is perfectly correlated with right-wing voting, right? So counties that people will believe vaccines are wrong or the virus doesn't exist, the pandemic doesn't exist, those counties vote right wing across the board. They're racist, they're backwards, they're anti-progress in all forms and against everyone but themselves. So uh, it's a global problem of what do we do with the declining uh, autonomy of science in the face of reactionary and superstitious attacks on science itself. So there is no, there is no authoritative voice. So uh, anybody next? Would like yeah. to come here? Yeah. Uh, hello. Can I speak? My name is Imran Siddiqui. Yeah, please, Imran. Uh, yeah, Siddiqui. hi. Uh, please, so, hi. Uh, so firstly, uh, thank you, Anik uh, Aniket, for inviting me. I haven't yet read the book, but I hope to do so in the near future. And it's also very nice to see uh, several friends and colleagues there, people whom I know, and especially Jairam Ramesh, who... Uh, uh, you know, whose actions have been truly remarkable in shaping the, the debate, you know, in the Indian context. And, uh, you know, uh, his, I, I, I was one of the people who served on the technical expert committee that went into uh, the GM uh, crop regulation. And, uh, you know, the, the last word is still not in yet on that. But, uh, you know, let me, I would like to, if I may make three you know, raise three points, you know, on this thing. So one is, you know, in the nature of the debate, there are a number of, uh, you know, among, among say opponents of GM, you know, there are many, many potential concerns 
that that people raise you know and many of these are hard to pin down you know so if one actually looks i think in the case of gm cotton which what is the concern the most the negative consequence that has been actually realized most clearly you know within the since the time that gm came in and in my view that is that the technology was applied in a in a in a bad context you know which is as hybrids and uh, hybrids i mean india was using india is the only country that is growing cotton as hybrids you know everybody else was growing it as straight you know high density contact you know compact varieties and they've been doing this for the last you know almost 30 years india is the only one that was not doing this and as a consequence although at a single at a per plant level the yield in the hybrid is higher at the field level you can actually you know uh, increase the planting density 10 times so the the you know the the total productivity at the field level is much much higher with these straight varieties you know and of course so this condition actually predated the 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 coming of gm cotton but gm was actually introduced in this very context so the problem continued you know in this way and it was exacerbated all right now you know the, the actual the, the 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 irony is that the regulatory in in our regulatory framework and you know i have we have looked at the reports and you know i went through all of the the technical reports of these of these committees in detail socio economic considerations were really not a factor at all although these are clearly there in the cartagena protocol and the regulatory processes in our own regulatory system there seems to be have been absolutely no recognition of the importance of taking into account socio economic considerations you know and in fact you know people scientists in general felt that you know look this is a purely scientific thing evaluation we cannot get into socio economic because that's that's too broad for us you know in these things and over the years now it it took a long time for scientists to actually recognize the connection between you know farmer suicides and you know the distress and the use of bt cotton as hybrids you know scientists people activists working at the ground level you know based upon their direct observations and anecdotal experience did come to that conclusion and there were newspaper reports but the scientific community as a whole you know really did not recognize this at all and only over the last couple of years there have been studies that have come out uh you know there was no data it was very difficult to get data on this thing so there are studies that have come out over the last couple of years that clearly establish a correlation between farmer distress and uh, you know and the amount of bt cotton being grown in these areas and you know so the so the evidence for this is very clear you know now so i think one is that in in the regulatory system for india you know for india i mean of course the regulatory system is the one that is supposed to interface and and mediate across these different interests and and uh, uh, and and so on but the inclusion of socio economic considerations as part of the regulatory process is very very important and has been ignored and i think continues to be ignored you know over the years so this is one thing and jairam is i understand the uh, you know he 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 i think this is something that the parliament needs to you know the the standing committee on on agriculture which was chaired by basudev acharya and they came out with a unanimous report you know on gm crops you know and because you know even jairam has said that you know he has agree you know there there there's broad agreement on this but i think this is one issue that really deserves to be taken up which is the inclusion of socio economic considerations as part of the regulatory process you know in this thing thank you Yeah, Ram. I'm sorry. I I I request you to be slightly brief here. Because... Yeah. Okay. I will be brief. Okay. Now the the now one is that one has to be wary. I think you know the emphasis on on uh, you know on technologies with the expectation of yield. You know everything gives you higher yield, but you know yield always comes at the cost of increased inputs as well. You know in these things. So that one has to keep in mind. So again, socio economic considerations. are a key part in this thing you may have a gm crop which is high yielding but which requires high inputs and if you just 
you know if if it is if it is approved for you know indiscriminately for use all over then it can it can really lead to a problem as has bt cotton you know in the case of uh, you know bt cotton hybrid the last point that i want to raise is very brief which is the nature of the gm model itself you know in this thing the regulatory costs for any gm crop you know to take it through the whole process is crores and crores of rupees you know in this in this thing it takes years and crores of rupees and you know by the time it comes around to deployment you know only developers with very deep pockets can actually afford this uh, this thing so you are actually favoring reduction in bio reduction in diversity and major major players i don't think even the government of india can afford this kind of expenditure on a on a range of gm crops so these are things that i think people need to keep in mind when proposing gm crops as a you know as a broad based solutions for for indian agriculture i mean there are many other factors that are probably more important but uh, but this is just which i put out there you know for uh, for consideration thank you yeah thanks ron any any last last comment um, hi before uh, i go to Paritosh, yeah. you have yeah. already written your comments. Yeah, so would you like uh, to say something? New? Yeah, I just wanted to add two points. Um, I have been very involved quickly, in please, yeah, quickly, involved yeah. in development of BT cotton and the lab of the GM master. So, just wanted to add that uh, one is the monopoly of the um, MNCs, like um, which is there in Indian market. So, if you have to break it, you need to push your public sector to produce more such kind of plants. so that is um, and and it's like in the bt cotton also you need every 5 or 10 years a new new kind of uh, harvest uh, uh, tolerant variety of the uh, must um, bowl worm appears so in that case you need new kind of genes also so just uh, uh, just stopping everything is not the solution but to promote the public sector to do more research on this and to identify more such kind of uh, new genes and uh, 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 just telling them to grow more such kind of uh, make more transgenic and put that into the market in competition with them and see is the solution rather than just uh, stopping everything and in the in the name of uh, Uh, just uh, checking and then trying and uh, i think i have been there for the last 15 years i am seeing that every year it's a new thing so i think there there should be some kind of consensus between the scientists thanks. and the, and the other agencies who can do that thanks for thanks paritosh uh, so so now i would request uh, uh, there are some new comments also in the chat box uh, you can go through and i request uh, jaram ramesh uh, to give his brief responses mr jaram ramesh are you around uh, i i just make one very quick comment to what dr shashidhar mentioned uh, the moratorium was not on biotech uh, the moratorium was on commercialization of uh, bt brinjal Uh, in fact um, along with the moratorium on bt commercialization of bt brinjal uh, my plea my call was for a, a more aggressive public sector r and d effort i find my my very good friend one of my favorite people deepak pentel uh, is has joined us uh, deepak pentel of course holds me singularly responsible for the destruction of agriculture biotechnology in india uh, but uh, in honesty in all honesty uh, the the speaking order was only on moratorium on commercialization uh, and nothing to do with larger issues of uh, biotech and you know what india should be doing uh, more aggressively now um, you know it's it just so happened that deepak pentel uh, deepak pentel became a test case for the convergence of the left and the right Uh, to stop the commercialization uh, i mean of of rapeseed mustard and this is uh, remarkable you know this gm technology is one area where the left extreme left and the uh, the extreme left and the moderate left the extreme right and the moderate right uh, all converge Uh, it's remarkable how there is a great deal of consensus why this should be so uh, aniket can uh, you know probably explore in another book but um, i i agree with suman that you know we need to get back onto the scientific track uh, and i am not aware of any debates 
in uh, in parliament in fact i have tried to ask the government in the standing committee about their position on gene editing and crispr but i have yet to get an informed response so uh, to the question on which ron herring has raised uh, let me in the next meeting once again i i've tried twice to draw them into uh, into a discussion but i think they have been badly bruised by deepak paintel's experience Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Jaram. Uh, uh, Suman Sahai, Dr. Suman Sahai. I think the first question I'd like to address is Ron Herring's question of why do we have hybrids when the whole world and his brother has invested and and correctly so in straight varieties. The reason why we have hybrids, insanely so, is because corporations wanted it that way. because the owners of the technology wanted it that way and they got that way that's the simple straightforward answer to why we are in this position on the um, lata's question of are we regulating crispr no we're not we're not thinking about it we are just continuing the same old same old on on uh, gm crops where the the regulatory system for gm technology is flawed as it is it is dangerous to pretend that uh, that crispr cas is is going to be similar and this argument has been floated uh, speciously floated that there really isn't a great big difference that if you have a regulatory system for for uh, gene modification you have it for gene editing also and that is where the danger lies but there's also a huge big lazy reason for not attending to it maybe the regulators have been have been bitten and not twice shy but that's no answer we need to look at crispr cas and we need to look very much uh, it is a called a, a, a simpler technology it's in fact a much more insidious technology the unintended side effects of crispr are far greater and more difficult to assess i mean with the with the gm crops we've got the allergenicity and toxicity issues okay there is there is more than just that but at least we flagged some things that that we should be looking out for with gene editing we haven't we haven't gone there at all and i think a lot of it is is uh, laziness on the part of regulators also again why hybrids because corporations want it in that way why we are not regulating gene editing also because corporations want it that way is is the short answer um i'll be happy to hear a more nuanced approach if somebody can detect one um amita about the pirated seeds is that a willful subversion or is that um a kurul model of many things that is happening my my take on that is that it is not willful sub subversion as much as a kurul model of things and i think chashidara raised that about how there's so much spurious seed because one of the things that is very well known when corporations are creating or uh, developing gm seeds they have a lot of wastage there are lots of seeds that simply don't pan out they're sort of halfway there three quarters way there but they're not all there and they don't invest uh <laughs> in a technology to take losses so they don't trash the seed by law they should trash the seed but it's convenient to let it sort of trickle out into the open market in a in a in a kind of a spurious way which everybody knows everybody is a participant in that it's essentially really to to not suffer the loss of trashing large volumes of seed that haven't made it that will not pass the test of a genetically modified seed and that seed comes into the market as as shashikant was also saying as um, a kind of gm seeds you don't know if it's gm and there are there are operators who track this this wasted seed who package it and sell it uh, to unsuspecting farmers so i think a lot of that is happening rather than i wish there was a, a more concerted effort to to smash the the patent regime but i don't think that that's what's happening Thanks, uh, Dr. Suman. Now, Shashi Dharak, quickly. Yeah. So uh, maybe in two sentences, in the context of the book, uh, you know, Aniket uh, has wrote, and uh, we all, you know, congratulating him for this book. You know, for the next book, I think 
you know, if you look at the, you know, as, as I just mentioned already on the, on the chat box also, I think our capacity in India to understand technology, to educate common people and on any technology is, is really, really minimal considering the population size 1.5 billion, right? So, I mean, the last two years of pandemic is also sort of, you know, give an idea of that, you know, how much we need to do to improve our public health understanding, right? And uh, and also to make people aware of what's the difference between, let's say, an mRNA vaccine versus a protein-based vaccine or a, or a inactivated virus-based vaccine. Means how many people understand this? Or how many people understand how a clinical trial is done, how clinical trial results are evaluated? Even if you want to constitute a, you know, a few committees, in a country of our side, if you had to introduce any crop variety uh, of, this, of this kind, we may need about 30 different you know, multi-location trials considering the geoclimatic conditions. And then do we have 30 you know, locations where we have experts who understand this kind of a technology and evaluate and address this? You know, I think we need to improve our capacity in, in our science and technology to even bring in technology from outside or develop our own technology, even to evaluate and methods of our, you know, uh, adoption for Indian, uh, you know, context. Uh, I think I'll stop here. I think we, we are not yet ready for such technology. I know CRISPR Cas9, I'm really dreaded already. If you had to try and introduce for any public health related, you know, intervention. It's okay for thanks, uh, thanks, 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 Sashi. Uh, Aniket, uh, over to you, your final, final words. Well, firstly, thank you to all the questions. Thank you to all those who asked questions. Uh, thank you for the comments and thank you to the panelists for their uh, comments and quibbles. Uh, so I'll just respond to two or three things because obviously this is a much larger discussion which uh, we have, we have to continue uh, at some other point and we I would be very interested in continuing. So first, let me take the point of, uh, just add one more thing to what uh, Dr. Sahai just said about why is India the only country which has hybrids? Uh, so one is because there is no incentive for companies to release varieties because they, they cannot enforce intellectual property in varieties here. So it's best to go for hybrids where the farmer has to come back to you. But the second important point is that um, a very sad failure on the part of our public sector system to release a BT cotton variety. Uh, Professor Anand Kumar was developing one uh, at NRCPB and it, for a variety of reasons, it didn't go through. And for some reason, you know, there was no attempt again by ICR to, you know, to renew that program and come out with a good BT cotton variety. And, um, and this incidentally, um, this point was made to me by Professor uh, Dr. M. K. Bhan, who, was, uh, who, who comes from the vaccine side of things, as uh, Mr. Ramesh was saying, and was Secretary of Department of Biotechnology. His own diagnosis of this problem was that in the public health area, the DBT tightly controlled what kind of products companies can come out with and under what kind of licensing and pricing regimes. He said, we didn't do that for GM crops. Now, had that happened, had there been at least, you know, the requirement that there's a simultaneous variety coming out from some private or public agency, our whole GM debate would have been different. Our BT cotton experience would have been different. And I just want to echo the other point, which is um, related to what Mr. Ramesh said, that public health may have definitely, I mean, I, I accept your point that I've underplayed the public health angle. Nevertheless, on the agriculture side, because, uh, you know, I've quoted a figure here that initially 61% of all the research funding for transgenics development was coming from the DBT. A senior uh, ICR official uh, mentioned to me that, that DBT's funding programs have altered incentive structures for ICR scientists to the detriment of plant breeding. And this is what I've been this is what I was trying to suggest through the book that even if public health was uh, the number one focus for the DBT, it's inadvertent perhaps or surreptitious influence in re-altering the priorities of agriculture research deserves actually much closer attention than, than I've been able to provide in this book. And the final point, uh, uh, why, sorry, two points, I know we are short of time, I'll be very brief. Uh, 
uh, why are why is cotton acreage increasing uh, i from i uh, from whatever shops i have seen selling cotton seeds whether in uh, northern maharashtra whether in uh, andhra telangana whether in odisha there are no gm variety there are no non gm seeds on the market and there are hardly any farmers who have heirloom cotton variety or cotton seeds or older cotton seeds so it's really a supply side issue uh, and this is why i'm a bit skeptical or i hesitate in stating sales figures and acreage figures uh, as sufficient to declare a success and just to add to dr sahay's point to amita's very you know uh, it's a very good question i i too feel having seen these illegal seeds per, circulating in 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 uh, odisha uh, that that firstly these yes i mean what uh, ronald herring had seen in gujarat and i mean yes there are these fly by night operators who may be producing uh, you know top notch uh, uh, you know gm hybrids on the sly through their you know back crossing surreptitious back crossing but the point is that these seeds are coming at an even higher premium than you know the government regulated prices for bt cotton seeds and yes farmers are i mean it's not farmers do take the shopkeepers uh, advice very seriously if they if they are recommended that these are new seeds try them then you know 9 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 farmers will you know uh, accept that advice at least for one season but beyond that the issue is that there is no accountability if the crop were to fail if a farmer were to spray glyphosate and even the cotton dies there's no recourse really for that expensive packet of seeds he has bought or she has bought and and therefore the real beneficiaries in the system are the are whoever and i have i have a whole box with these sort of illegal seed packets it's i don't know i would love to find out maybe in a subsequent research if who are these people who are producing them they are by my suspicion is they are you know just small traders or small seed operators in in vidarbha northern telangana part i don't know who they are but they are definitely making a killing uh and uh, whether we read that as uh, i mean it's it, the farmer is it's doubtful if the farmers are gaining anything or as dr sahay said are dismantling the patent regime through these actions uh there are many more questions but i think i'll stop here and uh, thanks uh, thanks uh, aniket and thanks uh, jaram uh, suman sahay shashi dhara and everybody who participated i have nothing else to say here of course just so many takeaways for aniket and for all of us yes. uh, for the future research and and to continue the discussion about technology about green and saffron about agricultural policy mm -hmm. about many things yes. so uh, so of course we will continue all these things uh, uh, thank you once again and and i hope to see you again thank you thank you very much <laughs>